Good morning. God bless you, Matt and Abby, as you reflect on your little one in heaven. Probably for most of us, we can, we can think of somebody that has gone on to be with our Lord Jesus Christ and in a sense just makes us to long to be there, does it not? And while we're all getting older and we're all living life and, and was very, very uh, real again this week, just reminded of how that we really don't know when that day will be. My sister's husband, my brother-in-law, had a 60-year-old brother that was at work, fell over, fainted, came to on his way into the hospital and wasn't with it long and fainted again. And that was the end. It was done. We just don't know. We just don't know. 60-year-old man. In the suite. By and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Let's stand together for a word of prayer again. And... Father. as we quiet our hearts before you for a moment. And think about the fact that someday all of us are going to face that judgment day. Someday all of us are going to either be spending eternity in heaven or in hell. There is only those two places that we will be for all of eternity. And God, this morning, it's my heart's cry and prayer that you would be preparing us for that day. God, the, that day that for some of us, we will, there'll be a reunion. There'll be loved ones that we will be going to meet. God, would you bless Matt and Abby today as they think about their little son that really spent very little time here on this earth. And you whisk him away into glory. And as they think about the fact that someday they will be able to reunite with their son. And others of us, maybe there's, there's our parents, there's loved ones that have gone on before us. And they have fought the fight. They have won the race. And we know that they have. And what a reunion that will be that day that we can reunite with them. And then, Father, as we think of the many people on the face of this earth, the wickedness, the evil that is all around us, the unsaved, the lost, The religious that are stooped in their religion and, le- and yet don't know you. The alcoholic, the adulterer, the unfaithful. The elite, the poor. And everyone in between, God that doesn't know you, 
God, would you somehow bring a revival to this nation? So that there would be more of these people saved and brought to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And God, we pray this morning for those that have never heard that you would somehow bring them the gospel. And yea, those of us that have heeded the call and as God's people, I pray that you would strengthen us, that you would lift us up, that you would help us, God, to, that we would realize that part of our call in life is really to let those know around us and to show those around us that our Jesus is real and that he's alive and that he actually came and he gave his life for our redemption so that we can be set free from these bondages of sin and darkness. Oh, God, help us. And then I think of those that are persecuted for your sake. God, they're beaten. Their heads are chopped off. God, would the glory of the Lord somehow shine through them into the darkness in those places, God, that the light of Jesus Christ would be real, would penetrate the hearts of those hard people. That they would crumble before you and recognize you as God. And then, Lord, we're gathered here this morning in this little place, in this little group. Would you come and be with us this morning? Would you bless us? Would you fill us with the spirit and presence of God? We invite you here. I pray that you would touch our hearts today. Meet all of our needs in our individual ways, in our individual needs that we have, that you would come minister to every heart in some way or another this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> God bless you all. It's good to see you all here this morning. Trust that you had a wonderful week. I thought about just opening it up and see if there's anybody that has a brief testimony on their heart or maybe something that God is doing in your life or did in your life this week or maybe a burden that you had. And we'll, have, we'll obviously have probably some opportunity for that later as well. Um, but uh, I'm going to do a little bit of an unusual this morning. It's been a while since I actually did this. It's been a while since I actually preached a salvation message, but I felt like as I was seeking the heart of God this week, for some reason, um, about middle week, God came, it just seemed like God came through and said, the gender it's time to preach a salvation message. And while that's probably one of the easiest messages for me to preach, in a sense, it's also one that often brings me to my knees. It's one many times that is kind of a soul-searching time for me. Seems like it's times when I'm drawn back to the cross. And I look at my own life and I take inventory. And recognize my failures before God. And humble myself before him and just allow him 
to again break my heart. Realizing that he is the only one that can really set us free and deliver us from our sin and from our darkness. So while it's an exciting message, it's also, like I said, one of those that often brings me to a place of, of searching my own heart and just laying myself before God again in a fresh new way. And as I was yesterday um, preparing and studying and just sitting back on the porch and allowing the, the music I was playing just to minister to my heart. And, and yeah, God just, again, just showed me how so many times I'm so selfish and so, yeah, I don't know what else to say, just so proud and so undone before him and it's just my desire to walk in humility and allow God to continue to 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 fill me with his presence and with his spirit and allow him to take me to the word of God and allow him to to fill me with everything that God's word has for me I think sometimes we see you know just a little bit of a glimpse of what God really has for us don't we yeah, we, we were saved and we understand Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed for us. And yet I believe that as God's people, as we live in America, there are so many things to sidetrack us in a sense. And, and there's so much in here that I feel like sometimes we just know a little part of. And, 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 my, and, in, and in these times, it's that God comes and just, and, and I just have this longing in my heart to just know more of Him. I want to know all of the fullness of God, everything that He has for our lives as God's people. Oh, I wasn't going to preach to God's people this morning, but anyhow. Um, turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 21. I'm going to read a story, a little short story here that... Uh, I'm going to read, and then we'll get into the message this morning. The title of my message this morning is simply this. The fiery serpent, a type of Jesus Christ. The fiery serpent, a type of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read the first nine verses in Numbers chapter 21. <clears throat> And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the, the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou with, wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered the voice of the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities and he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness, for there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. <clears throat> and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. <clears throat> we're going to stop reading there. <clears throat> and we're going to go back to verse number 6 is where I would like to uh, spend a little bit of time on, and then we'll go down from there. Verse number 6 says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. 
Now, I didn't, go, I didn't go back and look. I was thinking about this, and I kind of forgot about this. Then I was going to look this up to see if they have any idea how many people died of this plague from, from when, these, uh, when the, the children of Israel here were bitten with the snake, how many died, and actually how many lived, and all of that. I didn't look at all of that. But I believe that this, uh, this little portion of Scripture can very easily be taken into our day and age, into the life that we live here on earth. I believe this, this morning that while this says that many people died and that many people were bitten by this fiery serpent and they were beginning to die, as you can, if you can picture with me a little bit, um, you know, a, a group of people and, and it's a little bit maybe like COVID. You know, the people that are getting COVID and they're dying and it's, you know, you hear a lot about all of that and while, while yeah, it might be so and all of that, but I don't want to downplay all of that. But reality is there is something far greater than COVID that has bitten every soul of man, right? There's something far greater than COVID that has bitten every human being that's on the face of this earth. And yet it seems like we hear very, very little about that. We we don't hear much about that. You know... it would be amazing if we would hear across the news about the, 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 the fact that we have all been bitten and ensnared by sin. Wouldn't that be something if you would hear that across the news? And the amount of people that are dying in destruction and, in, and going to hell. Wouldn't it be amazing if we would hear about that in the news? But we don't hear anything about that. In fact, we hear, we hear very little about that. And I believe even in the church, I believe we hear far too little about that. I believe that we have in the church in a large sense come to the place where we rather preach about grace. And I believe we do need that. You don't hear much about hell anymore either, do you? There's not much said about it. There's not much preached about it. We would rather talk about heaven and about the lovely things of heaven and about the people that are there. And I understand that. But brothers and sisters, there's also a place called hell. There's also a thing called sin that came to us from back in the Garden of Eden. While I believe that we, you know, while I believe that we can't blame Adam for our sin, that is really Adam and Eve for our sin. That is really where it began. Before that time, there was no such a thing as that you were going to have to die. It was that sin that Adam and, Eve, and Adam and Eve committed that actually brought the sin nature into our hearts and into our lives. But we have all been bitten by the fiery serpent of sin. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people died. There was a lot of people that died. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon how many men? All men. All men. For that all have sinned. While Adam is the reason for our, while Adam is the reason for death, has come, the reason that death has come upon all men, we cannot use that and, and as an excuse for our lives today, can we? Because of Jesus Christ. Romans fifty three verse three says, "Every one of them is gone back; they're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no." Not one. There is scripture after scripture that tells us, and I was especially thinking of some of the the young ones growing up, and, and you know, you go through that age of your innocence, and you realize that you're maybe at a time in your life where you're not so sure that you're so innocent anymore. You kind of sense that maybe God is beginning to speak to my heart, or maybe God is beginning to call me, and he's beginning to show me my need of a Savior. In other words, you know, there was a point in time where mom and get, dad could take you out to the woodshed, so to speak, and they, they could take care of the problem, and your conscience was clean, was it not? And that's really the way that it's meant to be. But then there comes a time as you grow up and you begin to get a little bit older that the woodshed experience doesn't really fix it anymore. And you begin to realize that, wow, now what do I do? 
my conscience isn't so clean anymore. You know, I did something wrong, and mom and dad took me to the woodshed, and I could cry through it and pray through it, and I could be fine. But as you get older, there comes a time when you realize that that's not enough anymore. And God begins to speak to your heart personally. He begins to draw you. He begins to call you by your name, just like he did Samuel. He says, your name. He might say, Sylvan. He might say, Matt. Put your name in there. He might say, Zacchaeus. He might say, Paul. He might say, Silas. And you begin to realize that, wow, there's something wrong within me. There's something no longer right within my heart. You begin to realize that I can no longer take care of it myself. It is. That is simply that sin nature that has come upon you because of the fall of Adam and Eve. That is simply a part of the one, a part of the verse that says, All men, for all have sinned and come short of God's glory. 1 John 1 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, it says, We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you say this morning that you have no sin, the Bible says that you are deceiving yourself and that the truth is not in you. And who is the truth? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So in other words, if you sit here this morning and say, I have never sinned. No, I, I've never sinned. You have deceived your own self, and Jesus Christ is not living within you. That's what it's saying. He's not living there. He's not living there. That's kind of a sad state to be in, is it not? How well I remember March the 15th, 1987. God has been speaking to this little old Amish boy's life for about a year and a half. Not old, he was young, but anyhow. This young Amish boy's life for about a year and a half. And I had kept putting God off and saying, nah, you know, I, I want to spend some time with my friends. I was right at that age, you know, 15 years old or something like that, and right at that age where I wanted to, you know, just have some fun and felt like I didn't want to go there. I'll never forget that night. As I sat under the gospel messages, I sat, sat under the word of God, and you know what reality is? I don't even remember what the message was. But I do remember what took place. I was sitting towards the back, and, you know, yeah, I already had my mind made up before I went to the meetings that night. That ah, not, not tonight. I'm not, no, this isn't my night. I remember sitting there towards the back, and, God was moving and God was drawing people. And I had a younger sister. And the invitation was given, you know, and everybody was supposed to have their heads bowed and their eyes closed. But, nah, not me. I'm 15 years old, you know. I can do what I want to do. There I sat towards the back. And his invitation was given. My little sister. Thank God she obeyed. Got up off of her seat. And literally about ran up that aisle just weeping. And as I saw that, God just smote my heart. And I just crumbled. I was able to muster enough of courage together within me as a young Amish boy to get up off my seat and walk that aisle. And the weeping that I did as I 
knelt there at the altar. I feel like that's really when God saved me. While they, yeah, they took me downstairs and they prayed with me and all of that, but it seemed like that was the moment that I felt the Spirit of God coming into my life. And I remember leaving that night, and wow, there was, a, there, there was such a drastic change in my heart. I had such a heavy load lifted off of me, realizing that I could no longer take care of this sin problem within me by myself, that I needed something greater, that I need a greater power to move into my life so that I can overcome this in my life. I remember as I left there that night, I looked up into the skies, and I had never noticed that the sky was so clear, that the stars were so bright. In fact, my pillow never felt that good before as I lay my head down the rest that night, just realizing that in my heart and in my life, I had peace in my life. I finally was free from turmoil in my heart. And the next morning as I got up and went off to work, and you know, it, it, there was nothing more exciting. I, I just felt like a free bird. Now, I'm not saying that it always was that way and stayed that way. But God did change my heart and he changed my life. Don't tell yourself this morning that you have never sinned. Don't convince yourself that you have never sinned. In fact, may I take that a step further? As God's child, don't convince yourself that you can never sin. When we do that, we shut off the Spirit of God in our life. When we convince ourselves that we can never sin, when we convince ourselves that we can never walk away from God, I believe we shut off the Spirit of God to continue to show us the needs in our heart and life. We're still flesh. There are still bones in here. There are still flesh over them bones. And those things don't always want to do what God wants us to do, do they? Sometimes we find ourselves fighting against those things, battling against those things. In fact, sometimes, in fact, this was this way in my life. I wasn't going to go into all of this. It was this way in my life. I had a, an exciting time with Jesus for about a year and a half. And there was something in, very, something in very detail that I specifically confessed when I was born again. And Christ gave me victory and Christ gave me freedom. But there was a time when the enemy came back into my life and he brought these things back into me. And I allowed him to, to, to bring them back into my heart and into my life and into my mind. And all of a sudden the Spirit of God was quiet within me. And I realized that I have allowed Sin into my heart, into my life. Where did I go then? What do you do at that point? You have been saved. You've been born again. You've been transformed and you know it. And yet there's something in my life that has brought me down, that has spiritually dragged me, drugged me into despair. You know what? You got to go back where you left off. You got to go back where you started. You got to go back to the cross. You need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you afresh and anew again so that you can continue to walk in his ways and in his will. And for me, brothers and sisters, I'll be honest with you. It happens a lot oftener than I wish it would that I feel like I have to go to the cross that I feel like I have to go find cleansing, that I have to go be washed. But when you're washed, when you're free, when you have peace, You kind of get to the place where, you know, when you sense that God maybe isn't really moving in your heart. And, and I, I get concerned about that when I feel that way. You know, I begin asking God, God, what is it? What is it in my life? What's wrong? I'm not saying there always is something. 
But sometimes God puts his finger on something and says it's this. Or it's that. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's talking about Jesus. And there's something that I was thinking about here. You know, there's the, there's the whole gospel out there that, uh, that says that it's just for a few chosen. How can the Lord lay the iniquity of us all on Jesus Christ and it doesn't include us all? I don't understand that. If he laid all of our iniquities on Jesus Christ and Jesus took them to the cross, it's for all of us, not just for a few of us, not just for a select chosen. Brothers and sisters, I believe the gospel is for every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth. Amen? It's not just for a few. It's for all of us. <clears throat> because he has laid all our iniquities on him and he carried our sins to the cross, there is actually hope and redemption for all of us. Now let's go back to our text again in Numbers 21 and we're going to read verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Boy, I'm going to run out of time. <clears throat> um, anyhow, the, what I want to share here is the people of Israel came to the place where they realized what was going on. And there's something again that stood out to me here that, that I noticed and I believe that it's one of the biggest and utmost keys in our lives to be able to find victory, in our lives to be able to overcome, whether it's a sin that you've allowed back into your life, whether it's you've never been born again and you feel like you just have no power in your life, you have no ability. Let me tell you, there is a key right here that I believe that we can begin with. It says, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. There it is. That is the place that we need to all get to. In fact, that is the only way that you and I, even as God's people, when we allow sin back into our life, or it's the only way as you as a person, if you have never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, it's the only way that you're going to get to the place where Jesus Christ can actually come in and cleanse you from that sin and give you the power and the ability to be able to overcome that sin is if you get to the place where you say, I have sinned. As long as you don't get to that place, there's really not a lot that Jesus Christ can do. He says he will come and he will knock, but he's not going to force his way in. If you want to live your life defeated, if you want to live your Christian life unfulfilled, it's not God's heart, it's not God's way, it's not what he wants. He'll come and knock and he'll say, you know, if you would just take care of this, if you would just get your life cleaned up in this area, if you would just repent of this sin in your heart and life and allow me to change you, you could actually go somewhere. But he won't force himself in. But it is, the, the, the point is this morning, we must recognize that we have sinned. He's, then they'll go on to say, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now, I thought it was interesting here. Many of the other things that, that the children of Israel, many of the other times that the children of Israel would murmur and complain and something would happen and, you know, all the, and they'd come back to Moses and they'd cry and they'd repent and, and Moses would go talk to the Lord and the Lord would just take care of it. He'd just stop it. You think of the pledge, you know, he would just stop it. But the Lord, for some reason, didn't do that this time. He, uh, Moses was, I don't know what Moses was expecting. Moses, uh, as Moses was praying to the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, 
make thee a fiery serpent. Well, Lord, that's what these people have all been getting bit by. Now I'm supposed to make one. And set it up on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Right there is the type of Jesus Christ, if you didn't catch it. Our Lord Jesus Christ was set up on a pole, was he not, so to speak. He was put up on the cross, and all, all of our iniquities and all of our sins were laid upon his back. And he took them, and, he, and they were nailed to the cross with him. Why? So that we can be redeemed, so that we can be washed, so that we can be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So that we can look upon him, that we can gaze upon him, and we can actually find peace in our hearts and in our lives. As God's people or as an unsaved person. Moses seeks the Lord and God tells him to make a fiery serpent. Moses makes a serpent and puts it on a pole just like our Lord Jesus hung on a cross. I wish we would have time to turn to all the gospels and take a fresh look at what Jesus did for us. The crucifixion and go through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we don't this morning have time to do that. But we know the story well, how that Jesus hung on that cross, and we know that he gave his life for our sin. Amen? We know that he is our redemption. We know that he is our only hope. Whether we are lost in sin and have never been saved, whether we have backslidden in our lives and we have allowed other idols to take place in our heart and in our life to the point where we no longer really have a relationship that's flowing like this with Jesus Christ. Rather, we feel like this. We want to, and yet it seems like we can't. Something's got to be there between. Because if there's not, God just brings it together and brings us peace and brings us joy. <clears throat> I was going to turn to John 8, but I don't, I'm not going to because of time. John 8, the first 11 verses, tells the story of a woman that was taken in adultery. And we know the story well. That was caught in the very act of adultery. And the reason for the story was simply this morning. If you're in here this morning and you have never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, and you're, in a sense, you're feeling like you're under, maybe you're under conviction. The Spirit of God has been speaking to your heart. And you know that mom and dad's spankings no longer do the job. Or maybe you're in here this morning and you feel like maybe your life has been, uh, you know, you've not been really connected with God. And, and in fact, I'll be honest with you, the last couple of months I have struggled. I have had to live by faith and not by feelings. And I seek the Lord. And God may reveal something to me. And yet, it just seems I just have to live by faith and not by faith. And there is a time to do that. But I also believe that it, when we sense that happening in our lives, it's a good time for us to take inventory and look and see what's going on. What might be happening? Have I brought some idol into my life that is taking the place of my time and my relationship with Jesus Christ? It can be my job. It can be sports. It can be my truck. It can be my car. I'm just naming things off the top of my head. It can be anything, really. And God says, I want you to put that in its right place. He's not maybe saying that it's all wrong. It's not wrong for us to work. It's not wrong for us to make a living. In fact, I believe we need to. That's God's plan. But when we don't have time to do what God wants us to do because I'm too busy, then I start looking in and saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'll be honest with you, the last two years with COVID and everything that has taken place, with our inability to be able to minister in, 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 in active, real ways, you know, that we on purpose do. 
It has been very easy for me to get to the place where I just feel like it doesn't really matter. I have more important things to do. I can go to the ball game and holler and shout, and I'm not saying it's wrong. But what about when it's time to do something for God? I can go to work day after day, day after day, make money, make money, make money. What about when it's time to do something for God? Do you have time to stop and say, this is enough? God is saying, I do this. These last two years, brothers and sisters, I believe have affected the church in very, very negative ways in many places, in many lives. And I'm not excluding myself at all. It has brought us to the place where we feel like we are individuals. And we don't need each other. And we don't need challenge. We don't need stirred. We don't need this. We don't need that. In fact, a lot of people don't feel like they don't need to go to Sunday morning church anymore. You know, I can just sit at home and I can turn on the TV and I can hear powerful preaching. And the Spirit of God moves. We don't need the church anymore. We do need the church. And we do need each other. And we need to be alive in Christ. We have the account of the woman. They brought her to Jesus. And she was caught in the very act of adultery. And they said, a woman like this should be stoned. She should be stoned. She doesn't deserve to live. She needs to be stoned. And we know the story how that Jesus reached down and he wrote something on the ground and he looked up and, and you know, they were still all there. And then Jesus tells him that whoever is without sin, go ahead and throw the stone, first stone. And we wouldn't physically do that, would we? But. really deserves to be behind bars. And I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying he doesn't. But what about the stones that were thrown? And then Jesus uh, goes down again. He writes something on the ground. And he looks back up. And the guys that brought her to her all disappear. And there was Jesus with an adulterous woman. And back in those days, that was a serious thing for a man to be standing there alone with an adulterous woman. That was a serious thing. And he looks at the woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she looks at him and says, where is God? They've all left. Here's the words that I want for us to hear this morning. If you find yourself living in sin, if you find yourself uncomfortable with your relationship with God and there's things in your life that you know you have allowed there. These are the words I want you to hear this morning. The very words that Jesus told this woman. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go. And sin no more. Did she deserve to die? Yeah, in a sense. Do we deserve to die? Yeah. Yeah, we do. In a sense, we don't deserve what God has given us, do we? We don't deserve that. But when we find ourselves in a place where our relationship with God is not right this way. Jesus looks at you and he says, the sin that's in your heart, yeah, it's there. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, I can't bless you. 
I can't, I can't seem to give you a fulfilled Christian life. I can't seem to use you. I can't seem to, you know, I, I want to just pour blessings into your life, and I want to use you, and I want to make you a blessing, and yet it seems like I just can't. But he says to you this morning, neither do I condemn you. But he doesn't stop there. He says, go and sin no more. In other words, what he's offering you is forgiveness, is freedom. And then not only is he letting you with that, because he said go and sin no more means that he's offering you the power and the ability to be able to overcome that area in your life. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Sometimes we feel like we made a mess. We are in a mess. We have a mess. And then we feel like when we're in that state, we feel like we need to work ourselves out of that mess. Anybody ever been there? You can keep going to church, you can get baptized, you can do the right things, you can look right, you can dress right, you can, you can do all of those things. It's not enough to work you out of that mess. It takes Christ and his blood to cleanse us, to wash us. All he asks is that we recognize that we have sinned and that we need him. That's all he wants. Let's stand together. <clears throat> I know it's a bit late, but I felt like I should at least give an opportunity for anybody who feels like God has spoken to their heart. And you feel like you want to pray about it, you want to leave it at the altar, you want to leave it at the cross. In fact, I don't, it doesn't even have to be here. You can do it right where you are. You can fall on your knees before God wherever you are. But if you want to just recognize it and come and, and give it to the Lord, then just go ahead and do that. I'm going to pray, and then Dwayne's going to play a song just as I am. And as that is being sung, you feel free to come up and let me tell you. I want to encourage us this morning, if God has spoken to your heart, first of all, if you're here and you're lost, and you feel like, there's something going on within you, and you don't have peace in your heart. You don't really know that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to give you the privilege and opportunity to either tap your mom or tap your dad or tap somebody and say, would you pray with me? And then secondly, if there's something that God revealed while well, I was preaching this morning, I don't know. If there is, you just feel like you want to give it to the Lord afresh and anew, then you just do the same thing. 